And we are masterminding live with Mike Putnam. This is unprecedented. We've had him back by popular demand three times in the last three years. So welcome back, my friend. Very exciting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be back. Oh, it's great. It's great. You, um, your words of wisdom are phenomenal. The agents love it. They listen to your videos all the time. Um, so we appreciate it, et cetera. So why don't you do this? Just take a minute or two. Let us know a little bit about your background. Um, Reader's Digest version, a lot of them probably could cite it by memory. But uh, And then let's go into um, how this year has, uh, has changed some of the things that you've been working on. Sure. Well, I've been a real estate agent for 24 years. I've sold 2,600 houses in that time. I was fortunate that within the first month of my career, I got hooked up with Mike Ferry. So, you know, I've been following Mike Ferry and all those types of coaches uh, ever since then, which I think gave me a good foundation to build on. Um, you know, I think when you look at this year, this year, I mean, I've been on it 24 years. This is a year like I've never seen before. I mean, to me, out of all the 24 years I've been in real estate, this is probably the hardest market to maneuver. And I think, you know, one of the main reasons is the fact that, you know, two years ago, the interest rates were at two and a half percent. And now they're at seven. When that happens, the prices should have come down 15 percent, which would have made it a lot easier to work with sellers. Because when you're dealing with sellers, it's either the pleasure of them gaining money or it's the pain of them losing money. This is the first time that a seller can sit in their house at a 2.75 percent interest rate, wait for the rates to come down to buy another property and their house equity is going up, which makes it a very difficult, you know, maneuver uh, in terms of with the market to be able to maneuver. So, uh, you know, this year, year to date, I'm at 72 uh, under contract and sold. A year ago today, I was at 102. The dynamics this year, I'm at 51 uh, listings, 21 buyers. Last year at this time, I was at 55 listings and 47 buyers. So I think for me, I saw a huge shift at the end of uh, March, April in our market where the buyer demand, it just dropped off. The amount of people that wanted to sell their property, they started seeing the rates come up. Everyone wanted to wait. And, you know, for me at that point, I was averaging about 45 contacts a day, you know, following up on my past clients and doing that. But, you know, I started to realize that, you know, that's not going to be enough to hit my goal. My goal this year was to get to 200, you know, so you know, I've been through these kind of markets. So, you know, I had to go back and get in a mental place because, you know, for us, you know, Zillow Flex took a big chunk of our market. You know, I used to be a Zillow premier agent and, you know, we did 56 Zillow transactions two years ago, which was still a fraction of it, where now, I mean, it's not existed. You can't buy enough leads from Zillow because the price for a lead in Zillow, it's too expensive. We tried pay per click, but, you know, with less listings on the market, there's less houses for people to click. So even if you're trying to buy, you know, leads for buyer agents, it's the same thing. You're having to overpay. So the only way that you can adapt in any market, and Mike Ferry has talked about it for 24 years, is to pick up the phone. But, you know, me having a team, one of the challenges that I saw is that my team had never had to make 100 contacts a day. They see me do it periodically as the business needed it, but they've never had to do that. So for them, they didn't even think that that was possible. So the first hurdle I really had to get over was showing my team every single day that I would do it and making that commitment to them first, which I did. And, you know, the amazing thing now with my team is that four out of the five people are getting 100 contacts a day. You know, I have one guy, I mean, Robin, I mean, he got 700 contacts last week because I, I told him, I think the most that I had gotten in a week was like 705. And I think he finished with like 725. And, you know, and this market, that's the kind of thing that you need, you know, but as, a, as an agent leader, you have to lead first. It's not just tell people to make 100 contacts. You have to show them that that's possible because, you know, I post what I do every single day because people don't think it's possible. But I'm here to tell you, I mean, I posted before I got on the call, you know, today already I've got five, five five and a half hours prospecting. I've made 1,095 calls. I've talked to 101 people. I've got two leads and I've got one listing appointment for next week. And you're happy with those results? 
Well, the day's only half over. The truth is that after I get off of this and in, in, in doing that, I also went out and took a listing. Because a lot of people say I can make 100 contacts, but what do you do when you have appointments? Well, for me, I have Mojo set up in my car. So when I'm driving 45 minutes to my appointment, that's 45 minutes of prospecting. I get my listing and then I drive 45 minutes back, which is another 45 minutes. You have to think that's an hour and a half of prospecting that I got back just by making those calls in my car. And it's like, if you want to thrive in this market, you have to make adjustments. Your mindset has to completely change that. You know, if there's only two expireds a day and three for sale owners a week, who do you call? Because, you know, in January and February, we were flooded with expireds. But by March, all the expireds had drawn up. And that's where a large part of my business comes from is a lot of the expireds and for sale owners. I mean, we had three days last week where there was literally zero expireds. Last week, there were three for sale by owners. So it's easy for anybody to call three people. So it's like you really have to be on top of calling these people, because if you don't, there's so many other agents that are wanting to take your business. So Mike, appreciate that, that thought, you know, you're, you're hammering, you come right out of the shoot, boom, 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 boom. And, and which is great. I love it. The, the, the question that, that I hear is how do you, how do you, and how can you help our agents stay in the game Every day, every week, every month, every day, every week, any, every month. I mean, you have accountability to your team, which is great and probably part of the answer. But uh, you got any tips for us? I mean, I think, you know, the ultimate accountability to me is to my family as well as my team. Because, you know, I, my family having an extraordinary life is something that's important to me. Plus, my wife loves to shop on Amazon. So, I mean, if you really want to increase your production, find a wife that likes to shop on Amazon. I mean, that's a sure way to increase production because, you know, you have to stay afloat. But in all seriousness, you have to decide, like, what do you want? Because, like, I try to tell everybody, the market does not dictate your income. It dictates how hard you have to work, who you have to talk to, and how long you have to do it every single day. Like, I look at this market right now like war. When you're in war and you get deployed to Iraq or Afghanistan or Ukraine or wherever you're deployed to, how many days off do you get in war? What's your schedule like in war when things are difficult? And the truth is, is like you have to change your mindset, you know, because, you know, Mike Ferry has always said, if you make 30 contacts a day, you make three hours of contacts, three hours of prospecting, you can survive. And I'm telling you that if you do that, you will survive, but you won't thrive. If you really want to thrive in this market, you're going to have to do calls and prospecting and lead follow-up and hit your past clients in a way that you've never had to do before. Because you have to realize something, there's not an incentive for sellers right now to sell unless you can give them a reason. For buyers, everyone wants to wait for rates to go down. And when you look at a $400,000 house costing $3,600, you could have bought a $700,000 house a couple of years ago. So the affordability is something you have to work harder to find people. So I think, I think everyone has to realize that, I mean, you got to get in prospecting shape, mental shape, physical shape to be able to put the hours in that are required. I mean, today I've already got five and a half hours in. And I mean, it's, it's only three o'clock my time. After I get off of this, I still have till 730 where I'm going to prospect another three or four hours because that's the commitment that I made to hit my goal this year. Right. And so um, you were making a uh, more contacts last year or less or less contacts this year? How does how does the year change for you? Last year, I finished the year averaging like 46 contacts uh, a, uh, a day. Up to this year, I was averaging right around 60. In the last month, I'm averaging about 106 a day. So and you have to make more contacts to do more business. Absolutely. I think the thing that a lot of people don't realize is like we're so thought on there's just listed just sold the truth is is that if you're making massive amounts of calls it doesn't matter for me i pull up entire cities because my job is not just to find people around a listing and sale because you know i could pull up 200 numbers that lasts me an hour if i'm making a thousand to fifteen hundred calls it's who do you call so for me i'm pulling up entire cities again i'm calling the expireds three times by 8 30 i'm calling the uh, for sale by owners twice by nine and then from nine to 12, I'm cold calling around different cities, looking for people that want to sell. It. And it's, it's interesting that my own team, like, even though they saw me doing, they didn't believe it. And now that they've been doing it, they're like, 
oh my God, I, I can't believe that I got this appointment and I got this listing. You know, just in the last week, you've taken seven listings. And I don't say that to impress you, but it's like, that's because we're making a hundred contacts a day and we're literally putting our bandwidth out. I mean, when you talk to a hundred people a day, like the entire business changes because you don't realize how many people out there need someone. Because, you know, when I'm talking to people and they say they went away, I always say, is it because you need more time in your property or because you just don't think it's a good time to buy or sell? And when you say that, a lot of times it draws out the objection that they don't think it's a good time to buy or sell. And what a lot of people don't realize is that the prices of housing is going up right now. So if you're waiting for housing to become less expensive, you're getting behind the curve. And next year, when the rates pull down to five and a half percent, which they will in an election year, even more people are going to want to buy, which is probably going to put prices up higher. So it's important that we make sure that we're telling our buyers that, look, you can buy the house now, refinance. When the rates come down, you're getting in at a much lower price, because if a lot of buyers wait until next year when the rates come down, and all those buyers flood back the market, it's gonna be the same thing as we had a year ago where there's not gonna be enough inventory because there still won't be enough sellers, but there'll be two to three times the amount of buyers we have now. So Mike, let me ask you a question. Um, you have a crystal ball. In your professional opinion, for the, for the market to settle down a little bit and normalize, um, where are we gonna get the inventory from to be able to satisfy the the um, the thirst or the hunger, if you will, of this of the buyers, I get Thank a you. lot of questions from agents like, you know, when's this going to stop? How's this? You know, is it going to be musical chairs? What's your professional opinion on this? I think the agents that go out and hunt for listings every single day and commit to making the calls and commit to telling people the information that causes people to sell are gonna thrive like they've never had before. I mean, you know, it's been, I think it was 2016 is the last year that I needed to make hundred contacts a day. And I think that year I averaged like 120 because it was the same thing. There was no one wanting to sell their property. So if nobody wants to sell their property and everybody thinks it's a bad time to sell, it's our job as professional real estate agents to call up those homeowners and let them know that it is a good time to sell. And let them know that if they buy a property now, they're gonna be able to buy it at a much lower price now than they'll be able to get into the future. And again, they can always refinance the rate. And I just think that for the agents that are waiting for listings to pop on the market that are working with a lot of buyers, they're gonna suffer. You know, Right now as a buyer agent, it's tough because the inventory is low, buyers are a lot more hesitant. But I mean, I think the crystal ball is the solution to the problem is us or people just like you and your company that are willing to go out and make massive amounts of calls talking to massive amounts of people and telling them why it is a good time to sell and what are the advantages of buying right now. I think without good agents like us doing it, we're never going to recover the inventory we need to move the market forward. Got it. Okay. So what would you, I mean, how do you stay, how do you stay in the game? I get better said is how do you keep your head in the game? Are you doing this five, six days a week? What, what's the, What's the process I do, for you? I do, for myself, I do six days a week. You know, okay. I, I do 100 contacts a day, Monday through Saturday. Sunday is a day that I devote to my, uh, my family. But I mean, for this period of my life, and you know, the thing that's always helped me when I've had to go through times like this in my career is that I don't have to do it forever. I just have to do it now. See, that's the thing is that when you're making these calls, people are like, I don't want to do this forever. You don't have to do it forever. You just have to do it now because if you can get ahead of this market, you have to realize if the inventory is low in summer, what do you think inventory will be like in the fall and winter? It's going to be even lower. So as an agent, it's our job to go and attack the market. We have a four month head start before we get into winter to start getting people in the place that they'd want to sell their property. But it's, it's the most important thing right now is for us to go out and attack the market to really get in there and to go follow up with people. And, you know, for me, you know, if I get a lead, I send out a note card and then I follow back up with them in two weeks, make sure that they got it, ask any questions. And I try to close for another appointment. And then if I can, I'll schedule another follow-up call. I mean, in this market, it's a, it's a belly to belly sport. You have to get in and you have to talk to a lot of people, which, you know, for agents that have been in the business the last five or six years, they've never had to experience this. And that's why you're going to see massive amounts of agents 
that are get out of the business because you know you go to an open house you get two three people there's just not the the amount of buyers coming through the open houses like you had a year or two ago where you could get 10 or 20 people to come through we're just not seeing that at least not at our market so you have well, to realize that go ahead. a real estate agent if you're not calling people and nobody is calling you you're out of business so the question we have to ask ourselves hour by hour during our workday is do we want to be in business or do we want to be out of business? Because anytime you sit at your desk and don't talk to people and no one's calling you, you are literally turning your sign over and you're going out of business. I always see people say, well, my income dropped, but look how many people you talk to. Let me give you an example. Three years ago, every contact I made that year, I made $483. And the way that I look at that is obviously through Mike Ferry and the systems, you have a numbers analyzer. You take the amount of calls, the amount of hours and contacts you make, and you divide that by your income. So that year, I made $483 contact. This year, I'm at $159 a contact, which just basic right there, just letting me know that if I want to make $2 million like I did two years ago, I have to talk to three times the amount of people. So if it took me 40 last year, I have to get myself to a point where I'm talking to 120 people because that's what the numbers say. See, when you track your numbers every single day, it doesn't lie. And, you know, one of the things that always has helped me is that it doesn't matter what your income is this year. Take your income divided by the amount of people you talk to, and that will give you something. If, even if it's $11 a contact, that means every time you talk to someone and they say no, they just gave you $11. So for me, when I'm talking and I'm prospecting throughout the day, I know that every time someone says no, hangs up on me, cusses at me, they just gave me $159. How much more contacts would all of you make if you knew that every time someone said no, they were actually paying you? Be pretty awesome. I mean, but that's the kind of thing in this market. I think that a lot of the agents you have to adjust is you take the amount of money you make divided by your contacts. That gives you something that they're giving you every hour, every contact. Because when you know that people are paying you to say no, it makes you want to do it more. Got it. Mike, um, when you started in the business as a newer agent, let's kind of go back to that for a second right now. You know, look, sometimes it's hard for real estate agents to relate to somebody making 100 contacts a day and making $2 million a year. Um, let's take you back to maybe the prehistoric days and the days of the beginning. Um, mm -hmm. How'd you get started? I mean, I got started uh, at a like a mom and pop kind of company. You know, they were all taught how to do buyers. No one was doing listings. Um, so I got exposed to Mike Ferry and, uh, you know, I started going through the white pages. And I just I think my first year I went from A to probably like N, M, some, somewhere in that range. You know, I, I called for eight hours a day because, you know, I, I didn't have any business. You know, my my first year I did. 26 deals between April and the end of that year, which for me was, was, a, was more money than I had made previously. But, you know, one of the things that back in the day we had to do is, you know, we had two phones, you know, Mike Ferry said you had a headset here, a headset there, you double dialed. So, you know, I got exposed early in my career to making massive amounts of calls, but, you know, as, as your business changes, you don't have to do that as much because you have past clients, you have sphere of influence, but, you know, when I first started back in, you know, 1999, there just wasn't a lot of expires. There wasn't a lot of for sale bonus. So I came up making a lot of cold calls. And to me, that's one of the things that I really got started doing my business. Yeah. Um, okay. And, and as, as you grow, as you grew up in the business, do you work a lot with the scripts and dialogues? Did you have a natural gift to gab? You know, no. You know, I role played for the first 10 years, three times a day, you know, with the best Mike Ferry agents uh, in North America. You know, you, I got to gauge my skills, you know. I mean, we had so many good people. We had Neil Weichel. There was Dave Abdallah. I mean, there were so many good people that I got to role play with and you got to learn. And, you know, it's interesting because, you know, skills are so important. But then you start to see some people that are selling so much more and their skills are less because real estate is two parts. Part of it is skills. But the other part is having the systems, the tools, the strategies, and being able to execute. Because you could be the best prospector in North America, but if you don't talk to enough people, how many houses can you actually sell? So I started to realize making those role plays that you have to do that. You know, I went into a lot of NLP courses. 
I became obsessed my first 10 years in the business with just learning how to sell, learning how to talk. I think, you know, one of my early mentors was Ender Elke. He was like the number one prospector. I mean, I must have worn out his tape so many times because, I mean, the way he was patient on the phone and he was calm and the way that he was able to handle any objection, I just role modeled that. Because, you know, one of the good things about the community that we have is that you don't have to invent anything. There's so many good agents that are willing to help out other agents because, you know, one of the reasons I love coming back and talking to you is that when I was coming up, I was just like the other people on the calls. And I wanted to hear other people. I wanted to hear what they said. But the question is, is that, are you actually willing to do what those people said? You know, how coachable are you when you know that your coach is saying, look, you got to triple your calls. And you're like, well, I don't want to. The good thing is that you don't have to, but you have to realize if you don't triple your calls, your income is going to come down 50 to 60%. So what's more important, the effort of making more calls or playing it safe and just taking less money? Every agent that's on this call has to ask themselves today, am I willing to make a better version of myself and create the income that my family and I deserve? Or do I play it safe and just take less? And there's not a right or wrong answer for anybody. You know, I just don't believe in taking less. I believe that in markets like this, if you can thrive and survive in this market, like literally next year, you'll be so far ahead of everyone because you have to think if you're making 100 contacts a day or you're getting five or six leads, you're putting in your database every single day and you do that over 365 days. What do you think your pipeline would be like next year? Because you have to realize something. I mean, if I get 10 leads, two are probably going to do something in the next 60 days. You probably have another four that are in the next, you know, 90 days. And then the rest are probably another, you know, 12 to 18 months out. So we're prospecting for current future and that, 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 that middle business every single day. Got it. Excellent. So um, be specific about what you're suggesting right now, (laughs) because you're, you're saying a lot of things, but what do these agents need to do in, in the next three to six months to survive and thrive this market from your vantage point? I mean, I think the number one thing you have to do is you have to make sure, number one, you have a database. Label everybody A, B, and C. A is anybody has, that has ever given you a referral and you need to make sure that you are talking to those people every 30 to 45 days. You have B's, which is anybody you know, either in your sphere of influence or that's in your past client database that you know for a fact is going to give you a referral. And you want to make sure that you're calling them every, you know, 60 to 75 days. And then you have C people, which is maybe a transaction that you had in the past that didn't really go that well or people that you just met that you've added to your database. And you want to make sure that you're giving them a call every quarter. You're giving them an update. You know, it's time to go back to our database and provide value. You know, for me, you know, I'm throwing a a big pool party uh, at my house on July 29th. I want to get all my clients in there. I want to have an experience with them. It also gives me a great reason to call back and talk to everyone, invite them. Everyone's asking me about the market. It's a good time to talk to them. You know, you have to realize something. A lot of our, our, our people right now are very short on cash. So one of the things that a lot of us, when we're talking to our database that we need to be very specific is just letting them know that, you know, a lot of people right now have talked about refinancing and pulling money out to be able to pay for bills or different things. Do you know anybody that might be looking to do that? You'd be surprised. Some people will say, well, you know, I may want to do that. And now that's another way of trying to help them because if some people can't afford their bills and they can't refinance, the only thing that they can do is to sell. And what a lot of people don't realize is that a lot of past clients, if they know they're in financial trouble, they would actually be more hesitant to talk to you because of how they think you see them versus just coming and saying, hey, I need some help. So I think us going back and really talking to our our, our clients and being specific about certain things like that, it can add a lot of value and also making sure that we're doing something, whether you do a happy hour, whether you go visit them, you have some kind of a client get together where you can see them face to face and reconnect with those people because in the next 12 months, you know, 30 to 35% of your business should be coming from your past clients. And if you're trying to scale out your business, you have to make sure that you're putting in the work now to solidify those relationships. So I think that would be number one. Number two is that, you know, with the limited expires that are out there, you have to make sure that you're first, you know, you need to make sure that by 830, 
You've called every single expired at least three times. I choose to do it from different phone numbers so that people don't think that I'm some stalker. And then I call them again at lunch. And then I call them again on my way home. You know, you should have talked to literally dial those people by 830. For me, after that, I call through all the for sale by owners. The for sale by owners early in the year were very tough. I think I only took one, you know. I've got two appointments that I said in the last week from people. So I think the for sale by owners is another category that if you get good at calling and talking to those people, you know, and, and getting in front of them, you can add a lot of value to those things. And then the third thing is that if you call your database, you've called your expired, you've called the for sale by owners, the only thing left to do is to start calling around cities and asking people if they thought about selling their property. Most people will say, no, it's not a problem. Is it something you might look at doing in the next few years? If there's any interest there, they're going to hesitate. There's going to be something there. And then there's an opening. You know, I had two today, you know, one person's wife died, you know, three months ago, they want to sell in three months. And then I got another one that, uh, you know, they're retiring in November and want to sell by the end of the year. Had I not made those two cold calls today, I never would have had the opportunity to serve those people. But I think, you know, doing those four things, I think has to be the key to anybody that wants to thrive in the market is to first solidify your database and making sure you're reconnecting. Number two, making sure that you're hitting any expireds that come out. Like even on Sundays, although I don't work, I still call the expireds, you know, Sunday morning at 830. Normally we'll have what, two or three. I, I call them for 30 minutes from different phone numbers. And then I can be with my family. So I think, you know, on the weekends, there's a lot of low hanging fruit because a lot of agents have the mindset Monday through Friday. So when I'm calling Saturdays and Sundays, you really have limited amounts of people that call. And then I think the most important thing is Sunday between six and eight, following up with every single lead that you have. And if you follow through all of your leads, call through all the expires and the for sale by owners you couldn't get, and then go through and start cold calling. I mean, you know, I've set at least two appointments to three every Sunday between six and eight. It's probably the most profitable two hours I have all week because everybody's home. Great stuff, Mike. Mike, let's go back and let's talk about where your work ethic came from. Not everybody's as hard charging as supercharged as you are. I mean, developed, came from family. Talk to me. I mean, I used to be an athlete. You know, I used to play basketball. So, I mean, there's always been that competitive part, you know, for me growing up, you know, my father never told me that he was proud of me. So to me, it was like, no matter what I did growing up, it was never enough. So it's like, it always made me push to do better and better and better. I mean, it was weird that my dad didn't tell me he was proud of me until I was, I think it was like my third year in the business. I think I made like 380. And that's what it took for him to tell me he was proud of me. You know, and it's, you know, to him, it's like, I wanted to prove to him that I was something. And it's like, no matter what I did, it wasn't enough. But as you get older, you start to realize that you'll do more for other people than you will for yourself. So, you know, once I got his approval, it was more about what can I do for my family? What can I do for my friends? What kind of life do I want? What can I give to my community? You know, like if I go to work every single day, how many people can I impact? So when you start putting all of these other things that happen as a result of you doing your job, you do so much more because you have to realize something when you make more than you have to realize if you make 1 million or 2 million, your life doesn't change. Just like, you know, 500 to 750, it doesn't change. So like, if you don't have a mindset of wanting to always challenge and push yourself, you get into complacency. And the problem for a lot of agents, the last two years, including myself, is that if I look back at the last two years, I was very complacent compared to what I'm doing now. If I had put in a hundred contacts a day, in a market like we had two years ago, I probably would have made $4 million. But you see, the market was easy. So it's like I adapted to the market. I made an income goal, but I didn't actually make a goal to, can I push myself goal? And I'm, I'm realizing now that, I mean, if I create a five-year plan and I say for the next five years, what if I just push myself just like I do this year? I can't imagine where my business and my team and the amount of people that I could serve in my community would be because I think one of the things that I made the mistake in my career was making an income goal and not making a goal of just trying to push yourself. Like how much can you actually get out of your day? And that's one right. of the things to get to hundred contacts a day is that it forces you to be very good with your time because you got to get five to six hours a day on the phone to be able to accomplish that. And so my time with my business 
it's never been better. But you know, one of the good things about that is the time with my family has never been better. Because oh, I've that's learned great. a lot of time. Do you have uh, children old enough to get into the business yet? No, I have a one-year-old that's a girl, a six-year-old that's a girl, and a 10-year-old that's a girl. But you know, one of the beautiful things that I've really taught them is that if you want to have money, add value. So, you know, like a month ago, my kids, they made bracelets in the house for probably three weeks, went out to, you know, our pool in the community. And I think they made like $250. Wow. They were so excited about that. Then they went in and they made necklaces. And then two weeks later, they went in, and I think they made like a hundred and something. So, you know, I'm trying to teach my kid that instead of me just giving you money, if you want something, go out and add value, give something to the market that's valuable for them, making bracelets, stuff like that, you know, is something that they can do. And to them, when they make money, it's so much better than me giving it to them. So, I mean, I think all of us have to realize that people out there need us. Right now is probably the worst pool of real estate agents that I've ever seen. And I've been doing it 24 years. So what do you mean by that? They don't have the experience in how to adapt to this market. You have agents that list property and they list it at whatever the seller wants. And then the property doesn't sell. The seller takes it off the market because they think the market is bad. It's not that the market is bad. It's that they didn't know how to tell the price right away. Because remember, there's two parts to selling a house, price and motivation. A lot of these sellers have some motivation, but they just listed it at the wrong price. And the thing is, the people don't know how to adapt. When you hold open houses every single week and it doesn't work and the seller's telling you you're not doing your job, the question is, are there any other houses around you that are selling that you can take to that seller and say, look, your house isn't selling, but look, three or four rounds you have sold. And the thing is, is that a lot of agents, again, the last four or five years, they don't have the skills to have those tough conversations. You know, if there's anything that, I've learned being through Mike Ferry and going through the last 24 years is being able to have those tough conversations to be able to adapt your language so that you can help people go through the process. Because all people hear is what's on the news. Our job as agents to be able to navigate that, to ask them better questions so that they can understand not just lowering the price, but why they have to lower the price. So Mike, where did you learn that? Um, it's not, a lot of that stuff isn't taught specifically out there um you know some I mean, agents I, I go ahead I, you know i've been with i mean you know i've had a lot of great coaches and we've had kathy anderson i mean i've been with steve powers for you know 15 years i mean steve powers is probably the best coach that i've seen that i know in terms of how to talk to people how to handle objections how to say things better you know even when we role play i'll go through the role play and he'll say you know what it's not better it's different and he'll give me just a slightly different avenue that I can take that. And I think, you know, when you have someone that can help you evolve your language, it adds such an extra element because you have to realize something when you're making massive amounts of calls, you have to know how to sell people. And the way that you sell people is to ask great questions. You know, real estate is all about asking great questions. And if you don't know how to do that, real estate becomes very difficult. So, I mean, I think, on top of what we talked about, if I was any agent out there, I think you spend at least 30 minutes to an hour a day working on your scripts. You know, when I was coming up, any objection or something that I heard that I didn't handle right, I would wait in the evening. And before I went home, I would take two or three different ways and I would write down how to say that. And then I would ask someone at work to, hey, let's role play a little bit for 15 minutes. And I would work to try to implement that. I would write it and I would tape it to my wall. You know, when I was coming up, my wall was nothing but objection handlers, because all you need is that one great question to get to the next great question. And that's the good thing about learning dialogue is that as the conversation evolves, so does your income. So, Mike, you said things like this before and other great agents like yourself that said things like this before. And our agents have been on these calls. They, they listen to the messages. They review the tapes. They hear from me, they hear from Robert, you know, they hear from our coaches all the time, and yet they don't take action. Are they lazy? Are they, is it not that important to them? What do you think the difference is? I think they, Why don't you know, they do it? I think a lot of people don't do it because they don't have the belief that they can do it. You know, they know that it works for some people, but it won't work for them. And the truth is, is that it works for anybody. You know, it, it absolutely works for anybody that's willing to do it. You know, the thing is, is that the hardest part of anything is getting started. 
Like, I, I think I told you the story about the first time that I door knocked and I was so scared and I'm nervous and I go to the door and I knock and it's an expired. And this guy's always name is Harold. And he's like, he's hiding behind the door. And I remember like hearing, cause I always have the belief the first time is always the worst. And I remember like, I knocked and I could hear this guy. I'm like, Harold, I can hear you behind the door. Open the door. And he like opens it up. And I start talking about your house expired. And then he hangs and then he like shuts the door. And then I can still hear them. I'm like, Harold, open the door. And he opens up. And we had a conversation. I didn't get it, but it was just like the most horrific door knocking experience. And I mean, when you do anything that you're not comfortable with, it's hard. I mean, if you ask anybody right now, can they say A, B, C, D and sing the song they can? But how did they learn that? They learned up by saying it over and over and over. I mean, my daughter, that's, you know, one and a half. She's like learning how to walk. Would I just tell her at three to stop learning how to walk? No, you keep doing it until you get good at it. The thing is, is that a lot of people don't have the belief that they can do it. They believe that other people can do it, but they don't have the belief that they can take what you say and it actually works. And the, the, the truth is, is that if you actually do the same things that I'm talking about and you say the same things that you're telling them to say, it works. I have the people that work for me that are an example. I mean, you know, I have three new agents that work for me now, you know, and it's amazing that literally one was in car sales. He's one of the most patient people that I've ever heard, but it's so interesting that literally just being with me a month, how he's already internalized everything that we've said. And it's interesting to see, you know, in his first uh, two weeks with us, he got a listing and was able to get a listing his first two weeks just by prospecting and saying the same things. No real estate skills at all. You know what I mean? Then we had another guy, Robin, he was an, an agent that did one deal a year. I mean, and I'm listening to him and he's been four months. He literally sounds just like me. He's been with me like six months, but that's the same guy that I told you uh, before we got on the call that last week, I told him that the most calls I think that I ever made in a week was 705 and he got like 725. Imagine that. Imagine practicing your scripts, your dialogue 725 times to real people. I mean, if you did that, Literally for four weeks, you'd have almost 3,000 times that you've actually had to role play and prospect with live people. I mean, imagine how good anybody would be if you just put the practice in. What a lot of people don't realize is that prospecting is practice. So well said. So well said. Prospecting is practice. Doesn't get, I, I don't know that how you can beat that statement. Uh, so what, let's do this. Let's go get some. Um, Questions, questions for Mike Putnam. Questions for Mike Putnam. Just jump in there, please. Hey, Mike. How you doing, Mike? This one, Carlos. Um, good, how are you? Good, good, thank you. Hey, a question. You, you say the reason people don't take action is because they lack the belief that they can get it done, right? Mm -hmm. what, what can you do to, to develop that belief? I think the first thing you have to realize is that number one, you're a human being. So if some other human being did it, it's possible. Number one, number two is, you know, what are you doing to build up your mindset? You know, every morning I get up at five o'clock in the morning, the first 15 minutes I do, I go to TikTok and I just watch 10 or 15 minutes of motivational clips. You know, I normally will share some of the ones, you know, on Instagram that I, that I, that, 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 you know, align with me that day. But I mean, you have to work at getting the belief, but the ultimate way that you get the belief that you can do it is you actually have to do it. See, the thing is, is that nobody can implant confidence and belief in you. The only way you get confidence is by doing it every single day over and over and over until you get so good at it. It's just like, like the ABCs. How good were you the first time you tried to do it? How did you learn how to do ABCs? How do you learn how to do anything? How did you learn how to walk? You just did it over and over and over. A belief is only gained by doing the same thing over and over and over. The hardest part of real estate is repetitious boredom. So my question to you is, how good are you with repetitious boredom? That's what I'm working on. It. Yeah, but well, everybody's working on it. That's the thing is that the repetitious boredom is what stops it. Because like I said, already today, when I got on the call, it was three o'clock my time. I've made 1,095 calls today. I've talked to 101 people today. So 101 times I've basically said the same thing over and over and over. If you do that, how can't you have a strong belief? Because you have to realize something. The more you do anything, the better you get at it. And that's how you get confidence. That's how you get the belief. But you also have to have people around you that hold you accountable. 
It's like if I said right now, make 50 contacts a day. Or how many contacts do you make now? About 30. 30. So if I said make 50 contacts a day and you said yes, and then I said, great, send me a check for $100. And every single day you have to send me something that says you did it. And if you don't do it, I'll get to cash your check. Would that make you want to make the 50 contacts more? Absolutely. Yes. Why? Because the, the fear of loss. You know, to because give you there's the pain to it. So you have to realize something. You have to also put yourself in a place that forces you to actually do it. You know, when I started talking about 100 contacts on a, on a, on a podcast, like maybe it was like two months ago, I had like 90 people send me messages that you're lying. It's not possible. No one can do that. So I just said, you know what? Every single day that I work, I'll just go ahead and post it on Instagram so that you can see every single day. I normally post something at lunch and then I show you what I did at the end of the day because that's a way of me holding myself accountable to all those people out there that are telling me that I don't do it. So you have to create a plan that forces you to actually get the belief in yourself because the only way you're going to push past that threshold is having people around you that make you do it. Great question, Juan Carlos. Thank you, Mike. Great answer. Uh, okay. Wendy, did you have a question? No, I'm good. Oh, sorry. I thought I saw your hand up. Questions for Mike. My, my Go question, ahead, Josie. A question. My question is very similar to, I think, Juan Carlos. And that is, Mike, do you have, what do you teach your young, newer agents about uh, monotony? Monotonous, monotonous boredom. Boredom, yeah. What you know? What little tricks besides being accountable? <laughs> I mean, I think for the one thing that I try to tell everyone is that you know, if you take the amount of income that you want to make in a year, no matter what your income, let's say that you said what, what if let's say your goal was two hundred thousand, right? And you divided that by the amount of people that you would have to talk to, it would give you a goal. So every time you talk to people, you know that when you're someone is saying something to you that you're actually getting paid to do it. I think for a lot of people, when they're going through the monotony, they feel like they're not getting paid. So they're not reinforced to actually do it. So when you realize that people are actually paying you to say no, mentally, it adds something in there. But I think you don't jump from 30 contacts to 100 contacts a day. You could, but it's not sustainable for a lot of people. Because you remember, the goal is not to obtain 100 contacts a day or whatever that number is is to sustain it. So if you're at 30, the question is, in the next week, can I get to 40? Next week, can I get to 50? You know, when I'm, when I'm, you know, prospecting, you know, I also have, you know, like some motivational clips in front of me. I have music that I'm listening to, you know, I'm having fun while I do it. You know, if you were ever to come to my office, you know, we have agents that fly in where we have a pit and everyone's standing. And so, you know, we have a group of people that are all calling together. So I think, you know, if you're prospecting and you have people that are holding you accountable to it, I think it also makes it a lot easier. Do you prospect around other people or are you by yourselves? Both. Okay. Do you find it, do you find it, how do you feel when you're working with other people? Do you find that it, it pushes you? Oh, to absolutely. Make yeah. So I mean, what do you currently do to, 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 in the monotonous boredom? When the dial, the phone's ringing uh, and no answers, you know, I might start writing some affirmations. Yeah, I think one of the things that we also have to realize is that if you're calling the same people over and over and over, like I have a lot of agents I know that they'll call the expireds for six hours a day. Let me tell you something. If you don't talk to them by the morning, a lot of times they're not going to answer. So a lot of people are getting free contacts an hour because they're calling either really old expireds or they're calling old for sale owners or calling old people. And it's just like people that haven't answered their phone 60 times, they typically don't answer it on the 61st time. So it's like, you also have to change the people that you talk to so that you get more connections so that you have more engagement. When you're calling the same list, which a lot of real estate agents on the call, I didn't even get a chance to go through that. That's the biggest mistake that I see most people making is they're calling the same list 10 times a day. And then they wonder why nobody picks up. You know what I mean? Like you have to make sure that you're putting quality people in front of you that you have an answer. I mean, if you're cold calling an entire area on average, you're going to get like a, a 10 to 15% to answer rate. So if you talk to, you make 100 calls, you probably talk to 15, 10 to 15 people. Thank you. All right. Great, great question, Josie. Thank you. Mike, excellent answer. Tess, did you have your hand up? Yes, I have a question, Mike. 
knowing where we are in our market right now, and you already mentioned about our market, I heard you say that you need to ask a lot more questions. What is it that you really need to dig in and ask that question to really be able to troubleshoot why is it that they have to sell? What is your motivation? What is it? How do you dig into that? Like, for instance, on um, one of the calls that I made today, it's a cold call. I asked them if they had thought about selling their home here in the near future. We just put four houses under contract in the last two weeks and was just wondering if you thought about selling. They're like, no, not a problem. Is it something you might look at doing in the next six to 12 months? And the guy was like, well, you know, I'm retiring. OK, great. I'm just curious, you know, since you're going to retire, whether it's later or sooner, you know, tell me something. Are you going to relocate or are you going to stay local? See? You want to start asking in pairs of two to open up the dialogue. You don't want to ask when you know that someone is somewhat interested. You ask pairs of two. A great way is, are you going to relocate? Or are you staying local? And he was like, well, you know, we're probably going to relocate. OK, perfect. So were you looking to get into a bigger home, smaller home? Tell me a little bit more about what you want. I'm delving in to what he wants. And then the question is, you know, is it more important for you to take your time and wait here or would you consider putting it on a little bit earlier for then getting more money for your house? What's more important And him? He was like, well, if I could get more money, I probably would do it a little bit sooner. Okay. So it sounds to me that if you could get the right price, you probably will be willing to do it sooner. Correct. He was like, well, sure. See, I'm already opening up the dialogue. I took someone that said no. Then yeah. I took someone that said maybe six to 12 months. Then I found out that he was retiring. Then I found out that he wanted a smaller property. So it was very easy for me to then go back, well, do you have any locations in mind? He was like, I want to go to Charlotte. Okay, perfect. So I now have all of the elements that I need. So the only question for me now is, is it a timing issue that he wants to wait? Or is it that, you know, if he can get more money, would he consider doing it sooner? Because, you know, it's like the, 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 the carrot and the stick. What's, what's the, is it a condition? Or can I pull him in with money? Because yeah. most people, if they knew that they could make more money by doing it sooner, they probably would do that. You know, our job as agents is to create urgency. That right. is the number one thing you all have to realize is create urgency. Because if you go on the call and he says, yeah, no. And you're like, well, we thought about doing it in the next few years. Well, I'm going to retire. Okay. Well, is it okay if I call you next year and talk to you? And maybe then, you know, if you were like, that's not a sales call, but that's what most of us do. We take someone that says they have some interest of something. And then we just say that we'll follow back up with them. And we don't know anything about that call. To me, it's not a lead if I don't know why they want to move and roughly when they want to do it and why. If I don't know that he has a reason retiring, that's a good reason. Number two, as I got further in that call, he has family in North Carolina. Like, I know all of these things, but I only know that by asking questions. And I think a lot of you are very uncomfortable asking that. You know, it's much easier to say, hey, I know you're going to, you're retiring, you know, next year. Why don't I call you next year? And it's just like, you have to realize if you follow up on those leads and I call the same person, who's going to win? So what you don't realize is that by not asking better questions and finding out more about that person, you're hurting yourself and you're also hurting them. Because there's a lot of people that if they know all of, you know, all of the different elements and ingredients, you can help them a lot better and serve them. Do you find trouble with yourself in terms of digging deeper into those questions like that? If you're really listening and really getting engaged with them, you will be in the right connection. I yeah. think I, you are so right on that. The thing is, is that we just have to try to talk to these people. You know, as I said to me, if they're very hesitant, it's always easy. Are you looking to relocate, stay local? It's a very non-invasive question. You know, most everyone's going to answer if they have any kind of idea. And then if it's like, if they're local, great. Are you looking to get into something bigger, smaller? I mean, tell me, what's a reason that you would consider selling a good house? Got it. And then they tell you, but, you know, you have to be very patient with them. You know, when you start making calls, we're so nervous. So we just want to rush off the phone. And the thing is, is that you have to be patient with people, talk to them, get to know them a little bit. Because, you know, again, I would say on my lead follow-ups, 80 to 85% of all the cold calls they make, they always will say no, but ask them if they thought about selling the house. But then when I ask them if they thought about selling the house in the next few years, six to 12 months, depending on how they say it, I get a completely different answer. And then as I ask more, you find out people that said no, but these people are really looking to sell by, by the end of the year. Remember, you can manipulate time and you can manipulate money. 
Because for a lot of people, if they say, well, I want to be sold by the end of the year, that's very subjective. Are you wanting to do that? Because you just need more time in the property that you're in now. That's a condition. Or is it that you just don't think it's a good time to sell right now? You have to try to isolate why they're actually saying that so that you can then provide value about why they should do it. Because when I ask most people, if you could move your time frame up a little bit, but you got a lot more out of your house, would you see value in that? What are most logical people going to say? Well, I want right? to Yeah. So why don't I meet with you, take a look at your property. I'll realistically tell you what you can get. I can tell you the things that you would need to do. And we can discuss time. If you need to wait till the end of the year, that's always an option. But if there's advantages to doing something sooner, you certainly have the opportunity to take advantage of that too, don't you? Yes. Great. And then I set the appointment and go out. You know, in this kind of market, you may have to go out on two appointments to get listings. Because if you're dealing with people that are three or four months out, you got to get in front of them. Most people hire the first person that they feel confident can get the job done. So if you sound good on the phone and you can get in front of people face to face, you shake their hand, you add value, it's much easier to get that listing in two weeks or a month or two months, you know, because if I know they're going to do something in 60 days, I'm going to call them every two weeks and give them some kind of update in the market. But yeah. asking questions is the most important part, being patient. See, that's the thing. It's not just making cold calls. It's having dialogue, trying to get as much out of every call. Because again, everybody's going to say no. I don't, I mean, it's rarely ever. I'm like, so have you thought about selling your home here in the near future? Yes, I thought about it. Come over. I don't know about you all, but I don't get that. You know, they make me earn it, but you know, I don't mind doing that because I know that the more people I talk to, the more people I help. And by helping more people, I get to make more money. So everybody wins. Sounds great, Mike. Really appreciate it. Um, uh, Last question here. Emma Montes uh, wanted to know, what do you consider a contact? A contact is anybody that has a defined reason and that I know why they want to move. I know when they want to move. And I have a, a, a definite period where I, I have between 12 and 18 months. I don't take anything past 18 months. But to me, a lead is someone, for instance, I know that they're moving to Charlotte. They're relocating. That's part. I know why they're wanting to do that. They're wanting to go to be closer to family. And then I also know a when factor. When do they want to do that? Because, again, I can manipulate time if I understand their reasons for doing that. Got it. Got it. All right, everyone, unmute yourselves. Unmute yourselves. Let's go. Let's give them a big hand. All right. Good job. Good job. Fantastic. Mike, we're going to, uh, I don't know if you have a hard stop on this. I went a little bit long. I apologize. Uh, But we're going to go around the room and ask everyone what they learned from this call today. Kind of get a feel for it. You're welcome to hang out and listen. and or uh, we'll catch up with you soon. Sure. Okay, so uh, what did we learn from Mike Putnam today? Who wants to go first? Mike's got great energy. I love his energy. Energy sells, doesn't it? it? does. Absolutely. Okay, what else? What else did we learn? Go ahead, uh, Jackie. Asking great questions. That's it. Asking great questions. Good answer. What else do we learn today? Kamal, did you have something? Yeah, I do. Um, hey, Mike, I like how you said, I mean, I, I mean, basically what you said, how I interpret it is you just got to work hard. I mean, you got to go out there and you have to grind, like you said, you know, and you got to put that energy into the clients and it's going to reciprocate back to you. So I just like how you said, we're all human. And if you can do it, Mike, I can do it. And then there's no difference between me and you. The only difference is you're more determined. And so I just got to find that determination, but I appreciate it. I think, you know, the harder you work, you start to realize that your scripts and dialogues get better very, very quickly with the more people that you talk to. You're, you're role-playing for five hours a day, all of you. I mean, how good would you be in, in 90 days? Uh, time is money. Time is and money. Mike, and Mike, you're more confident, Mike. Like when you talk to people, when you practice the scripts, you don't have to worry if someone says no, because, you know, okay, on to the next one, or you mm-hmm. dig in, but... Absolutely. Okay. So Prospect- important. Prospecting is practice. Mm-hmm. Prospecting is practice. That was a great thought. That was a great thought. Role play is practice, but prospecting is also practice. Absolutely. Good thought. Yeah, uh, you bet. 
A no. What is else? Money. What else did we learn, Anna? Go ahead. A no is money. I like that was totally flipped it for me. Yeah. Exactly. I can't remember where I heard this from. I thought I heard it from you, Mike, but I'll give you credit for it. A no simply means not now. Correct. A no means not now, and boy, does that help me because even sometimes at this stage of my game. Uh, a no will slow me down. And I keep remembering it. It's just not now. It's just <laughs> not now. Sure. Okay. Um, today. Calling morning, Thank afternoon, and evening. That, Emily, do that, that again. Question. Sorry. Um, it's always been a question of mine. Do I call the same person multiple times in the day? And yes, you do. Got keep it. Through it. Change your list. Change your, and change your list. Savannah, what did you got? Uh, change your goal from an income goal to a how hard can I push myself daily goal. Like that. That's my favorite market, one. Honestly, in this market is the most important thing. You know, if you're willing to push yourself in this market, you literally can transform your entire life in six months. There's so much money to be made in the next six months for the agents that are actually willing to go out and do it. I mean, I can't stress that enough. I'm talking life changing money. Yeah. Good. Great thought. Okay, now, Mike, okay. you, said, you said a lead is someone you know when they're going to move, why. Now, so what do you consider a contact? Like, is that someone who stayed on the phone for like 20 seconds or someone you asked how they're doing? A contact they said, is oh, anybody no. that you ask if they want to buy or sell a house. Okay. If you're calling and they say, have you thought about selling your home in the near future? They tell you to go F yourself. There you go. You just paid me $159. Thank you. Got it. The contact. <laughs> Got it. Okay. What else do we learn? Again, Free urgency. Urgency. What's more important, money or the rate? Yeah, the urgency is a really important, important point. Tess, go ahead. I would Planning say your that day. What I like the way what he said to be patient. And I'm guilty of that. When I'm talking to a client, I rush. I, rush I never and noticed that. Tess. <laughs> <laughs> I rush, I rush uh, because I want to hear that appointment. But I think really being patient with them. Be I think the more that you the more that you can internalize what you're saying, you don't have to worry so much about what what you're going to say. So you can focus on what they're saying. When you know your dialogues and you internalize those, you can be patient because you actually can listen to what they're saying, and then you can say back what they what what you want to say, but say it in a way that they can receive it. You know, analyticals you say something different than if you're a driver, so it allows you to say things the way they can hear it, which allows even better. Exactly. Got it. Anyone can else? Can Go I ahead. You know, to Mike? Sure. When you're dealing with a driver and you know time is important for them and you said be patient, how do you deal with a driver person? Well, it's easy. You know, you thought about saying something in the future. Well, I thought about it. Great. Well, I mean, if I could get you a good price in the next two to three months, would that pose a problem for you? Just get to the point. Okay. See, drivers are very, drivers either want to do it or they don't want to do it. You know, you're not going to sit there on the phone and ask a driver 900 questions. You know, I mean, I, I lean more towards driver, but over the years, I've been able to be a lot more versatile so that I can talk to more people. When I was young, I could only work with drivers just because I was very quick, fast. But as you practice more and more and more, your dialogue changes and it allows you to be able to be more versatile with different kinds of people. Thank you. Good job. Sorry, who else had their hand up over here? So, you know, Neil, what I, first of all, Mike, thank you uh, again for the third time for, for doing this. I mean, it's just, uh, it's such a breath of fresh air every time you come on here. But the the thing that I, I, I really hope, he, one of the things I hope people got out of it is when he talked about how you have to know the marketplace meaning that telling a buyer right now, hey, look, if rates go down next year, which they expect to because it's an election year, right? Because that's what he said. It's an election year, and election years, the rates always go down. So you have to know this stuff. Rates are going to go down next year when there's an election year, which is going to bring more buyers in and more buyers, It's but it's not going to create more inventory. Like That's what Mike said, because they're not building houses and people who are in that 2 or 3% rate in their current house, they're not in a rush to leave. Correct. So all it's going to do is bring more buyers, which then will lead the prices to going back up, which is either A, going to price you out as a buyer, or B, you're going to deal with so much competition that you're not even going to get the house to begin with. 
And so, but, but it, you have to be able to know that stuff and be able to have that conversation because if you can't and a buyer says they want to wait, you're stuck. So that, that little segment that he did right there, I hope everyone kind of understood and got what he was talking about. Yeah, good, point. A, good point. Good point, Robert. Thanks. Go ahead, Mike. Oh, and I was just saying, I mean, it, you, you have to know those things because, again, everybody in this market that you talk to wants to wait. Every seller I've talked to wants to wait. Every buyer wants to wait. It's our job to tell them why they shouldn't. And if you don't know, you better find out. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> good job. All right. Unmute yourselves. Unmute yourselves. Let's give him a big hand. All right. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. Fantastic, thank you. Mike. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you again, Mike. We've posted your name and information for referral purposes. You got referrals going out to this guy. He's going to get them closed. There's no doubt in my mind. <laughs> I love it. Okay. Um, let's see. Ashley, who's on open mic now? We got Frank at one, then Caesar at 1.30. Back to Frank at two. Gonzalo at 2.30. Three o'clock, we have Gabby. And then 3.30, we do have property pricing property tips with Robert at 3.30 today. All right. Fantastic. Uh, okay. Thank you, Mike. It was great. Thank you. Neil, Mike, what, again. Was your, what was your favorite point, Neil? You know, um, it, hold on. I wrote down over here. Um, by the way, Mike, uh, nice, uh, can't even read my damn handwriting. Nice, photo, nice picture in the background. Love it. Oh, thanks. <laughs> so, so basically, basically the consistency that I heard again from Mike is get in and get your database fixed. I don't know how many times we have to tell you. Now we provide at no cost a fabulous database. Oh and we also have at no cost uh, for you a great coach to help walk you through the follow-up boss and, and setting it up, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, at what, and I did ask you the question, Mike, at what point, you know, are real estate agents just plain ass being lazy um, or they are um, just don't get it? I, I don't know. I mean, I think it's a combination of both, but I think the laziness is more hesitation and that they don't know. You have to realize if you don't know what to say and do, it's very hard to do anything. And I think a lot of them are. But not they're lazy, doing. but well, I agree with you. However, we have a virtual role play every single morning and I've done it five days a week for the last three years um, and they're never in a situation where they're ever not going to have a role play partner never okay because okay. if they don't have a role play partner I'll be there and I'll be their role play partner okay I, think they, I, I don't think that they understand the value of skills in this market you know if you don't mm -hmm. know how to talk to people and ask questions and be patient and you don't have your dialogue it's going to be very, very hard for you in this market. So, I mean, I think they undervalue the importance of scripts because you have to realize two years ago, what scripts did you have when a buyer was running to your office telling you they want to put an offer in $50,000 over, waive everything? There's no skills necessary. Now skills are right. You're when right. People are running to you, you have to go find them. And it's a lot harder to find people than when they're running to you. So, I mean, skills are literally outside of the execution of the most important part. Well, it's kind of interesting. You had mentioned that you thought this was a harder market. Um, I, I think the market we came out of where it took no skills, this is just my personal opinion on this, where it took vir virtually no skills. You were an order taker. And, you know, it, and, and the only thing is that if you could talk them into giving 50000 versus $40,000 more, you might win the race. But I think you're I think you're right until you try to scale that when you're scaling 200 transactions a year as an agent with with three or four people. It's a lot harder because, again, there's not as many people that actually want to do something. You know, it's harder. It's harder to find people in this market that want to do something. Everybody okay. wants to 
do something in the previous market. At least okay. it, the way I looked at it. I mean, every yeah. seller wanted to sell because they were getting a hundred thousand dollars more. Every buyer wanted to buy because the rates were two and a half percent. I mean, I bought my house two years ago for two point three million. My payment is like ninety two hundred. If I bought my own house right now, it'd be twenty one thousand. I mean, interest rates or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, 100%. 100%. We absolutely get that. Okay. Thank you again, Mike. We'll be in touch. I appreciate uh, it. Thanks. If you need anything thank, else. Thank you. Appreciate it.